Zoo Boys, Chapter 1, Part 2 All Ron, Jeremy, and David had on their minds was Zoo Island. The boys ranged in age from 11 to 13 years old, although David would argue that he was almost 14, and it was so close to his birthday you might as well consider him to be a young adult. David was also moving on into high school and would be leaving behind his two closest friends. The three of them fully realized that this trip may very well be their last big adventure together. These were the same three boys who snuck into the forever happy amusement park. Though they left no evidence behind and no charges were ever pressed, this time they invited a fourth kid. Johnny Meyer. Johnny was already 14, already in high school, but he was pretty immature still. John was bullied, teased, taunted, and pressured to trespass with the other three last time, but he was too afraid. This time, he didn't want to back down. He figured that the boys got away with it before, so this time, they'd be able to do it again. He told himself, as long as I am with them, everything should be fine. The four boys arrived to Zoo Island on a small blow-up river raft that Jeremy's mom got him last Christmas. Jeremy had to break a few rules laid out when he got the raft, but he planned on the truth never being told. The trip was supposed to just last Friday night, one full Saturday, and if it was going well, they would camp a second night, returning home sometime Sunday. It turned into two nights and two days, because the raft got a hole in it, and it sunk upon their arrival. The top secret trip really wasn't a secret at all to the other kids their age, but no adults were made aware. David was pretty defined had pretty defined muscles for a boy his age, so his threats that he'd beat the crap out of anybody who told on them was enough to keep most kids' mouths shut. When they're, when you're an elementary or middle school age kid, that kind of threat is all you need to keep, keep your lips sealed. It was reported that they were last seen in a small raft just offshore of a small campground. The worried parents and the volunteer search parties were starting to assume the boys must have drowned. No one knew how the boys could still be alive, but they were alive, very much alive. In regard to where the boys were, unknown to anyone else, there were other creatures that were left behind, born, survived, and now thriving in this once fully functional zoo. It was here where, at one point, spectators observed various species behind thick glass walls and iron bar cages. The zoo itself didn't generate enough money to stay open, so the owner and the staff expressed their frustration by leaving a lot of things behind. They removed what animals they could, but they were unable to catch some of the exotic birds and few stray creatures that were masters at disguise. They were also completely unaware of some of the hidden nests of creatures that were a new breed of animal formed by injecting strands of DNA from one species into another. Before the zoo was abandoned, all the cages and cells were left open. Given anything left behind them, free roam on the island. Ron, Jeremy, David, and John secretively planned this trip for months before their summer break, just as they did with their trip to the park. They did some research and found rare maps of the island. They not only read about the history, but embellished the truth as they told other kids how much danger they would be in and the risks they were taking. 
They puffed up with pride on how brave they were. The pride made them feel so alive and special, unaware that, many times, lies will lift you up just to violently throw you down, right back down into reality. Rumors of Zoo Island were part of this town's culture, cultural fiber. Although the boys freely told other kids of their plans, they purposely did not tell any adults. There were so many things said about Zoo Island, no one was sure what to believe. So, it was completely off-limits to the general public. The crazy scientists who built Zoo Island and poorly managed it were like a dirty stain on their town's moral reputation. Regardless of how many lies there were about the island, there were enough documented facts vouching for how dangerous and even deadly the abandoned island was. As with the Forever Happy Amusement Park, John Hansen was always experimenting with strange and unusual, unorthodox ideas. In many people's opinions, he was trying to play God by creating new species, joining two very unlikely species in test tubes and incubating them until they formed entirely different, sometimes damaging, results. The majority of adult uh, town folks weren't sure whether to believe all the hype behind the stories they had heard about the forever happy Zoo Island, but children found it fascinating. Fans of the movie and books about Jurassic Park compared that fictional work with the stories they heard regarding Zoo Island and what was being done on that island. John Hansen's creation, although he wasn't creating dinosaurs, were very similar to the stuff written only in science fiction and in recreated, recreated in movies. Mr. Hansen was mixing the extremely dangerous Komodo dragon DNA with who knows what other animals. Individuals in scientific circles, very credible scientists, agreed that Almost everything you heard was just a myth, impossible to perform, while others believed the stories wholeheartedly. There were just enough stories out there to convince people in this day and age that anything is possible. Some spent their time and efforts protesting, saying the place should be shut down. They felt that it wasn't morally right to mix reptiles with mammals. It was said that the island was the home of the first giant scorpion, the size of a torpedo, thus the name Scorpedo. Animal rights activists drew pictures of torn and bloody stick figures in the claws of the Scorpedo. Scorpedo. Dave had a poster on the ceiling above his bed illustrating the creature taking over a large city. The city was dwarfed by the enormous body, claws, and tail of this awful freak of nature. The poster had the Scorpedo printed across the top in red lettering that looked like someone painted it in blood. At the bottom, it had a scoreboard in a stadium at the end of a football field. Real tiny, you could read, score, people zero, Scorpedo all. Some of the organizations protesting used the same poster insisting John Hanton and all the Forever Happy Inc. Uh, be inspected by authorities to assure the safety of the general public. Most were fixated on what threats came from the zoo, while a few others, mostly younger people, were caught up in fascination and potential groundbreaking discoveries being made. Those against John Hansen work, uh, those against John Hansen's work felt that the risk of exposing mankind to more danger wasn't worth taking a chance on. Some of the hype was a bit overboard, but until the real facts were presented, nobody really knew what level of threat existed. 
It wasn't the protesters that caused the park to shut down. It was the overpriced admission to enter. Average middle-class people could not afford the entry fee, so regretfully they had to shut down and shut down quick. They simply, there simply wasn't enough income to pay the employees. John Hansen did not look at it as a failure, but was going to try and cut corners in order to cut costs. That was another mistake John Hansen would not accept as a failure. The four boys in this story were determined to enter the abandoned zoo and gather as much information documenting what it was like, what may have been left behind, and, in their eyes, be considered some type of heroes. Ron even brought a hair comb with him so that they could all make uh, sure their hair looked good for TV and pictures that were going to be taken for any article raving about their success. Before, during, and after school, Groups of children would pass the time by talking about what they heard about the zoo. One kid swore his uncle was actually there while it was up and running. Another girl said her cousin worked there. The talk ranged from the type of terrain to the type of tragedies that were co uh, contained on that island. The, de the debate over the... Uh, in ability of survival for certain animals not native to America was combated with the folklore of soil and vegetation being brought over all the way from places like Thailand and Fiji, along with other exotic things only in very wet rainlands or very hot and dry lands where animals like the Komodo dragon live. The foreign plants and conditions would meet the needs of those species. It was said that Hansen and his staff had sealed off rooms created to control the different climates required for the growth of some never-before-seen plants and animals. There was some documentation from medical records proving that some people working there were seriously injured. All the children took parts as as they uh, I'm sorry. All the children took part of what they heard and wrapped what truth eyewitnesses saw to grow their own tales. Tidbits of information turned into full blown stories. The four boys were going to bring back not only their personal experience, but photographic evidence and video of what they what it was really like on that island now, and what may have been left behind, in hopes of increasing their own popularity. The adolescents' own curiosity also needed to be quenched. The little town of Northport, Florida, had a few wild birds dwelling in it, ones that came from the island. A few newspapers showed photographs of unbelievable creatures that allegedly crossed the water between the island and the mainland, but didn't survive. Some people claimed it was fake news. Others gave their accounts of seeing them with their own eyes. There was enough history, facts, and fiction to fill many books for several generations to come. But our four boys wanted to write their own book, and it would all start with that raft ride. The raft they used was not intended for serious bodies of water. It wasn't just a pool toy, but not far from it. It was by no means worthy of going out into the deep. It came with two short plastic paddles, and it had to be blown up. The boys took turns adding their own breath into the vessel. In between turns, it, it was inevitable that some air would escape, no matter how hard they tried to pinch the valve or block it with their tongue. John, the newest and slightly oldest member of this made-up gang of boys, was good at making quick sketches of things. 
Ron, the youngest, liked to write. Jeremy, a bit on the nerd side of things, owned the ref. And David, the pure jock, he had all the guts needed to convince the others that they just had to go on this quest. The original three boys, David, Jeremy, and Ron, would rarely stop talking about anything else but their past experience inside the abandoned amusement park. Now, it was time for this new, next new venture. John was kicking himself for not going with them the last time. He recalled how when the authorities questioned him about who was in that park that night, at first he confidently acted as if he knew nothing. But when it came right down to it, the night his new friends broke the law, he was the one who told the ad adults the other three had entered. The other boys didn't know that John was the snitch. When kids told them John was the rat and Johnny was confronted by David, Ron, and Jeremy, he blamed some girl and swore he'd never be an informant for the police. This was partially true. There was a girl who told the park authorities their names, and John only confirmed it. Once again, just enough truth wrapped in a lie seemed to at least make it believable. By going on this trip, John felt that he would somehow gain their confidence in him. Another one of John's attempts to gain popularity was by personally drawing pictures of the other three sneaking in the park, racing down slides, and escaping the crazy, deadly funhouse. He gained their admiration, not only with his ability to draw almost anything, but by specifically drawing them so well. In John's artistic interpretation of them, he was sure to include extra muscles. John portrayed the boys as larger-than-life action figures, like the ones they enjoyed in their comic book collection. Ron wrote about their saga, and eventually he, John, created their own little comic book called The Big Dog's Feet. Big Dogs is what the three called their little gang. John wasn't quite in yet, but between stroking the other's egos and going on this trip, he hoped they would accept him as one of them. Ron helped by sharing his writing skills with him. Jeremy had a major crush on John's sister. She had the same name as his own sister, Karen, but unlike his sis, she was a fox. So that helped with John's inclusion. Dave thought John did a great job capturing his likeness as the muscle-bound leader, even if it was just hand-drawn. So, John kept trying his best to score likes. He figured this trip would be the final initiation, and he'd finally feel fully accepted by them. That's the complete end of Zoo Boys Chapter 1. Uh, below there'll be links to the other stories, the written form of it, and to the uh, next videos as well.